All rise, please. This court is now in session. The Honorable Bruce L. Pickett presiding. Thank you. Please be seated. Case 2019-5906, State of Idaho versus Philip Michael Schwab. Mr. Schwab is present along with counsel, Mr. Jordan Crane. The State of Idaho is present, represented by Ms. Elaine Bean, as well as Mr. Danny Clark from the Bonneville County Prosecutor Attorney's Office. We're today for a scheduled sentencing. Are you ready to proceed, Mr. Crane? Yes, Your Honor. Ms. Bean? Yes, Your Honor. All right. The court does have a question to, to take up. The court received uh, on June 30th a two-page letters from uh, Leslie Folsom. I don't know if counsel received that. I, I have received copies of those. I purposely didn't submit them, Your Honor. Okay. They were not solicited from the defense. I, I moved to strike those and asked the court not to consider them. There's also a letter, I think, from Ms. Folsom, maybe that was filed some time ago. I'd make the same motion to strike that. I'd prefer it to be sealed, to be honest. Well, the court has received them on its computer program, but that, and that's the question whether the court is, whether there was an attempt for the court to consider those or not. So that was the question. As counsel knows, sometimes on these things, things get submitted. And so just a clarification, did the state receive these? I don't recall seeing those, Your Honor. Um, do you have them in your files? I didn't receive them through the court by the process. Okay. Let me just indicate the the court will provide you see the copy. The court doesn't intend to use those at all or, or consider those. Uh, there was one that was filed some time ago as well. I was going to make that motion once we got started. Okay. We got the earlier one. It's it's fine with the one that just came in if we're not using it. Yeah, the court doesn't like I said unless the cat unless parties wish to submit that as evidence or part of the what the court should consider, the court is not going to consider those, okay? Uh, let me do one other thing here. Crane, there's also a psychiatric, psychiatric sentencing evaluation that the court received on the 30th, which is today, through the file. Did you submit that? Is that from Dr. LaCroix? It is. Because I would have submitted that. May I inquire, did the state receive that? We received it a couple of weeks ago. I, I filed that on the 15th, Connor. The court read through a psychiatric evaluation. But like I said, this one just showed up, frankly, minutes ago. So I'm, I, let, give me just a second to see if it's the same one that was re received previously. Thank you. 
first wants to make sure that all the documents are as they should be in this case. Give me just one second. Let me just indicate that the, the psychiatric, psychiatric sentencing evaluation that for some reason showing up on the computer on June 30th is the one that the court reviewed last week, so I'm not sure why I'd like to tell you, but I'm just, the Odyssey program the court has is still signing in, so we've been waiting for that to happen. Uh, but uh, I can tell from my notes and preparing for it that it's the, set, it's the evaluation the court had previously reviewed, so I'm not sure why, unless there was... It, was there a different submission, Mr. Green? Uh, I can only assume that it may, maybe it was the pre-sentence investigator who, in some roundabout fashion, got in their hands. I don't know who would have submitted that. Um, I, had, I hoped it would be treated kind of like part of the PSI and attached and, and sealed as, as the court knows under that rule, because I don't want it to be part of the public record. So. And I, that was this court's intent, because the, the court reviewed the, both the pre-sentence investigation report and that evaluation at the same time. Governor, we would stipulate that it just be part of the PSI and be sealed in that fashion. Right. Just to clarify, there is a uh, psychiatric sentence sentencing evaluation submitted by Dr. LaCroix. It's dated June 4th. The court reviewed it uh, in preparing for this sentence last week. I'm not sure why the computer shows it being submitted or resubmitted on the 30th, which is today. Uh, but it's the report that the court had reviewed. So the court's going to attach that to the pre-sentence investigation report and have it treated uh, as if it was just part of the pre-sentence investigation report. All right. Uh, apologize for that. Like I said, it's, it's an odd computer thing. But uh, Mr. Schwab, let me read the history of this case. Uh, at the time of your arraignment back on November 19, 2019, you're informed that information had been filed against you, charging you with the crime of murder in the first degree. At that time, you pled not guilty. However, on April 20, 2021, you again appeared in court with your attorney and pursuant to a plea agreement, which you were previously plea of not guilty, in your plea of, of guilty as charged to murder in the first degree. The plea agreement was that the state would recommend a specific sentence of life with no more than a minimum of 25 years. Your counsel, you were going to recommend minimum, uh, life with, would recommend not less than 15 years. This was non-binding upon the court. After I accepted the guilty plea in this matter, I wrote a pre-sentence investigation report, which I have received and reviewed. A copy of it should also have been provided to you through your attorney and has already been discussed the court has also received a psychiatric sentencing evaluation, which the court has reviewed as well, and has attached that to the pre-sentence investigation report. So let me ask Mr. Schwab, have you had a chance to look at and review that pre-sentence investigation report? Yes, you have. Mr. Crane, are there any parts of that report that need to be clarified or corrected? There are, Your Honor. The first correction will be on page three. Mr. Crane, let me indicate that typically I'd go into that other program and make the changes, however, it's still signing on. So uh, I'll just take notes and we'll correct that later, but go ahead. Thank you. On page three, it will be in the companion section. Okay. Uh, there's a note, notation that states some acquaintances are involved in criminal activity. That should actually be none. I have the, the packet that Mr. Schwab filled out for the PSI. He circled none on both of those questions. Um, unless the pre-sentence investigator is figuring that some people in jail may have been involved in criminal activity, but frankly, no one Mr. Schwab was involved with prior to being incarcerated was involved in criminal activity. So we would ask the court to correct that. All right. On page four in the attitudes orientation section, um, I take great issue with everything in that particular Subsection, I was part of the pre-sentence investigation interview. It was conducted via Zoom. The investigator's camera didn't work. Um, it was maybe 30 minutes. As soon as we got to the issue of DuJour syndrome, the investigator basically shut us off. 
I have no further questions. And that's part of the reason I didn't provide the evaluation to her was because I didn't think she was going to give it the uh, care and attention that this court and that prosecutor would give it. So um, we take issue with the fact that, that she claims Mr. Schwab lacks empathy, and I'll get into that in my argument. We take issue with the fact that he doesn't appear to have the ability to be sensitive to the impact of his actions. And we take issue with the fact that he feels his sentencing recommendations are unfair. He did indicate that a 20 year sentence would be fair, and I think that was noted, which exceeds our recommendation. I think he's just a little trepidatious about a life tale because of his, his condition and not knowing what that would mean. It's an uncertainty, and that's kind of what he was expressing. So we, we would take issue with everything in that particular section. The court's going to note that as you're taking issue with it. However, the court also recognizes that that's the thoughts of the pre-sentence investigator. So and, I'm not going to correct it, but, I'm going to, but I appreciate the, the sentiment you've expressed. And, and it also increases his LSI score. For what it's worth, um, that significantly increased his LSI score. Um, I guess my only other corrections would, would be in the, in the recommendation portions of the, the pre-sentence <coughs> investigator's report. I understand that's opinion. Uh, we're simply going to ask the court probably to do a way to review the, you know, the length of the investigation, the care and attention she actually put in. Okay. Right. Um, finally, Your Honor, for what it's worth, on page 8 of the game evaluation, it indicated that Philip completed through grade 11, he actually graduated high school. So those are all our corrections. Of course, I'll correct that on eight. Schwab, do you wish to stand by the plea of guilty you previously entered in this case? Yes, Your Honor. Are there going to be any witnesses on behalf of the defendant? Just argument today, Your Honor. All right, and just to clarify for the record, the court did receive letters, however, is not going, frankly, I have not read the one that was submitted today. Uh, did not intend to without authorization from the parties. The court's not going to include that in its considerations. I haven't read it. Uh, we will provide a copy to the state but will not attach that to the previous sentence investigation report, need, nor any previous letters will be attached. Is there any witnesses or victim impact statement on behalf of the state? Yes, Your Honor. Tristan Blue will be making a statement on behalf of the uh, Blue family. I do have uh, Kaylin's family, Randy and Sharon, uh, are the parents, and sister is Brittany, and then there's numerous other loved ones in the courtroom today. So I would invite Tristan to come up he did want um, the court to have access to some photographs that I would submit as a demonstrative exhibit at this time and have provided copies to Mr. Crane. Those have been provided already? Yes. Any objection, Mr. Crane? None whatsoever. So I just want to clarify, there's going to be one victim impact statement on behalf of the whole family, even though other members of the knowledge other members of the family are present today. That's correct, Your Honor. All right. And it's Tristan Blue? Tristan Blue. All right. Blue, I'm going to have you can either sit or stand, however you're more, get more comfortable. There's a chair there, however you want to do it. Uh, I will ask you to spell your, both your first and last name for the record, and you just go ahead with your statement you'd like to make. Okay. You, you can pull the mic over. You don't have to bend over. It, it moves on the table. You can, you can pull it over. It's okay. Perfect. All right. Can you hear me all right, Your Honor? I hear you just fine, sir. Thank you. Um, so... First name Tristan, T-R-I-S-T-A-N. Last name Blue, like the color, B-L-U-E. Thank you, go ahead. Your Honor, I want to thank you for giving our family the opportunity to express how the loss of my sister has affected my family, as well as many others in the community. To start, I would like to highlight that Kaylin radiated Mr. positive. Blue? Yeah, I apologize. Sometimes when you read, mm -hmm. you read faster than, than we speak. We have a court reporter that writes everything down that, that just say it. Okay. So I recognize it's difficult and I wanted to kind of stop before you got going too far, but if you could just try and slow down just a little bit if you could. Fair enough. Okay, thanks. Sir. Yeah. To start, I would like to highlight that Kaylin radiated positivity, love, and compassion. 
She would do anything to help other people. She saw the good in every person, and she was extremely proud of her accomplishments. She was always working hard to excel in her career. She finished her associate's degree and had a gold award in Girl Scouts, which was something she was very proud of. One thing anyone can tell you about Kaylin is that she did not care if she knew you for a day or for her entire life. She would always do the right thing and help somebody in need. Kindness was at the center of her actions. Kaylin was a special kind of person, and I don't say that lightly. On June 24th, 2019, our world changed. Anyone who knew Kaylin knew that she was highly reliable. She would never miss work without calling in, and she stayed in touch with her family frequently despite living in another state. A friend and coworker of Kaylin's contacted my sister Brittany, asking if she had heard from Kaylin. At first, we did not know all the facts and thought may, maybe something was wrong with her phone or for some reason she didn't have her phone. None of us were aware of the Facebook posts because we were either not friends with him on Facebook or we had unfollowed him. Unfortunately, things quickly became concerning. When Brittany called asking if I had heard from Kaylin and that nobody had been able to reach her, this instantly triggered a red flag since Kaylin was always conscientious of letting someone know what she was doing at any given time. I tried to call her, no answer. Bernie called me about 30 minutes later, telling me that the police were searching the property and that it wasn't looking good. After I tried calling again with no answer, I left work to try to make it home to be with the rest of my distressed family while imagining the worst case scenario. I barely made it on the train home when I got a call from Brittany telling me they had found Kaylin's body. I went into a state of shock as I curled up into the seat I was sitting on. I was struggling to process how much of a significant loss I had just suffered and the impact of that loss on my family as well. I was especially concerned about my dad who was having heart issues at the time and I feared that the news could result in the loss of life for not just one person in my life, but for two. That same night, our family traveled to Idaho Falls which culminated into a stressful week full of legalities, lack of sleep, anger, depression, and extremely traumatic events. We lived anybody's worst nightmare. We met with the police at the prosecutor's office and we cleaned out her belongings in the place that Kaylin had lived and was killed. We attended a memorial at her community garden. Cremation arrangements were then made, which was when my mother, sister, and Mr. Schwab's mother and aunt decided to see Kaylin for the last time. During our time in Idaho Falls two years ago, I learned so much about what she meant to her friends and community, which included her co-workers at Walgreens, the members of her community garden, and even the family of Philip Schwab. I mention this because I want to paint a picture of how her positivity touched so many lives. I want to also remind the courtroom that the grief Philip Schwab's family members felt and continue to feel regarding my sister's homicide is every bit as important as anyone else's in our family. And although this is the least substantial part of losing Kaylin, it is important to note that Mr. Schwab's actions have cost our family thousands of dollars in fees. I can't even put a dollar amount on how much money we've spent between her services, airplane tickets, gas, hotel rooms, food expenses, other traveling costs, and lost wages from missing work. One thing that Kaylin's traumatic loss has taught me is that everybody grieves differently. Part of my grieving process involves spending many nights over the past couple years lying awake and asking myself the question that I'm sure many of us have asked, which is why. I spent many nights over these past couple of years searching for the answer through flashbacks of the times that I spent with Kaylin and or Philip, thinking about signs that I could have missed. I spent many days bonding with Philip and talking with him about how we can always choose to be good people even though we make mistakes. He communicated to me his ability to recognize that people are in control of the choices that they make and that he could make better choices to improve his life. Philip also displayed to me signs of guilt and a poor self-image that were a result of mistakes he made in the past. He always talked to me about how he was never good enough for Kaylin and even told me that taking his own life had even crossed his mind. Reflecting on this knowledge, 
I was led to a quote from a wise man that said, those that don't care about their own lives don't have the capacity to care about the life of another. For my sister Brittany, grief and suffering also came in the form of sleepless nights and nightmares. Having seen Kaylin one last time after her death along with the space in which she passed, Brittany still has nightmares imagining what could have transpired in the last moments of Kaylin's life. Brittany felt seeing Kaylin was important, but she also recalls that viewing the intense number of stab wounds engulfing Kaylin's face and upper body have been extremely traumatizing for her. Something that was remarkably hard for all of us, but was particularly unsettling for both my dad and Brittany, was finding out how much Kaylin suffered in the process. Your Honor, Kaylin was terrified of anything in her skin, from needles to knives. She was so terrified of having anything sharp touch her skin that even at the age of 33, she did not even have her ears pierced. Philip was very aware of this and still chose to end her life in a way that was beyond horrifying to her. Kaylin was incredibly close to many other members of our family, particularly her aunt Cindy, who is also present today, along with her uncle Chris. Cindy and Chris want you to know that they grieve every day for their niece. Not a day passes that they don't grieve immensely for the life she loved living. Kaylin would call Cindy often to see how she was doing, to ask for advice, or to tell her what she had done that day. She wrote Cindy on a beautiful birthday card and called on June 22nd to wish her a happy birthday. They talked about getting ready for work, the horrible thunderstorm Cindy was in, and what their plans were for the next year. She had just turned 33, and Cindy turned 63 just before Kaylin's life ended. Kaylin always put others before herself, every time. She was truly the happiest person Cindy and Chris had ever known. Cindy recalls her love for her family, friends, and for her job at Walgreens. She felt like part of the family there. Kaylin loved to garden and organize things. She was very good at both. Nothing in the world could ever make up for her loss. Anyone in this courtroom can agree that the value of human life is immeasurably high, and therefore the loss of a, of a human life is also immeasurably high. The vast majority of us in this part of the world get the privilege to spend around 80 years on this earth and get to choose how we live those years. Kalen's life was cut short at age 33 by someone who has shown that he doesn't care about his own life. Kalen no longer has the freedom to breathe the breath of air and stretch as she gets up in the morning. She no longer has the freedom to go see her friends at Walgreens to brighten their day with her smile. She no longer has the freedom to welcome people to her community garden to show them her harvest. She no longer has the freedom to call her family to let them know what's going on in her life. Most notably, she no longer gets to be there for life-defining moments, like seeing her niece grow up or to see me get married. She will never get to meet any other nieces or nephews. Kaylin died when the most important person in her life was only 10 months old. Her niece Danica will never know who she was beyond a few photos hanging in her bedroom wall. For my parents who spent over five years trying to conceive her after many miscarriages, her loss left a wound that could never really heal. My mom remembers her by video, pictures, and memories. My dad has fond memories of when she was young. He loved to take her fishing. He also reminisces on how she called often to try to keep him and everyone else organized. Brittany remembers her by video chat she did several times a week with her daughter. The only thing I have to remember her by is a few voicemails I have saved on my phone. So at this point in my speech, Your Honor, I do have um, voicemails, a couple of voicemails on my phone. Um, would it be okay to play those? Sure. Go ahead.
She no longer has the freedom to spread love and compassion towards someone who's struggling or having a bad day. Your Honor, I'd like to point out she did this all the time, no matter how she was feeling. Before I express our input regarding sentencing, I would like to express that while many of Kaylin's family and friends may never find forgiveness, myself and many others have forgiven Mr. Schwab for his transgressions against my sister. I don't forgive Mr. Schwab for his benefit, but rather for my own benefit. Without forgiveness, Your Honor, we can't be free of this pain. It has taken two years, a pandemic, and a lot of emotional processing for us to get here today. Today is a very important day for everyone sitting in this courtroom, and while each of us could sit here and tell you what we would like to see as far as Mr. Schwab's sentencing, I would like to sum it up with these two questions. Number one, at what point should freedom be granted to somebody who irrevocably took away the freedom and life of another person? And question number two, when considering the safety of the community, would it be reasonable to allow someone who has not shown value to another personal another person's life, animal's lives, and his own life to go free at any point. We all believe that negative and dire actions have negative and dire consequences, and I do believe that despite Philip Schwab's noted disabilities, he knows this. Our family knew Philip Schwab for eight years leading up to Kalen's death. In that time, even though we were aware of his diagnoses and limitations, at no time did he ever appear as unable to discern right from wrong until he decided to take three lives from this earth. A wonderful researcher named Brené Brown once said, there is no justice without accountability. You can choose courage or you can choose comfort. You cannot have both. In difficult cases like this, accountability and courage are the first steps to justice as well as the pre prevention of future homicide in the community. This starts with sentencing Philip Schwab to life in prison for the life that he took. Thank you for your time and consideration. Are there pictures? intended to be part of the record or how do you want to Your Honor, uh, we, we don't, we weren't anticipating the court necessarily needed to keep them. The family just wanted you to see them during this process. Mr. Crane, is that I, whatever the court is to say? They were submitted as demonstrative evidence which the court has reviewed and seen. I'm going to keep them from the court's portion. We'll return those at the end of the year. Okay. Thank you. Anything else by the state as far as witnesses or victims? Not at this time, Your Honor. All right. Mr. Crane, before I close sentence in this matter, I'll let you argue on your mind's behalf. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, this, this case is, is hands down probably the most tragic case that I've had uh, in the 20 years that I've been practicing law. Uh, and that's based in large part on what you just heard from Mr. Blue. Um, aside from, from child victims, rarely do you find a victim that no one has a bad word to say. Is nothing but good in the world and did absolutely nothing to deserve what happened to her in June of 2019. Not, not a damn thing, Your Honor. 
That's tragic. There's no excuse for it. It shouldn't happen in our society. This case, though, what, what magnifies that tragedy is, is Mr. Schwab's situation. Um, we have someone who is an exhibit of any signs of violence in his 35 years. And then for something like this to happen, it makes you wonder why. Phil isn't some man who got drunk and wanted to walk across the street and rape and mutilate a young woman and then spend the next 20, 25 years living his life while another man rots in prison for his crime. He's not some gangbanger drug dealer that kidnaps a girl and is going to take her up to the foothills and execute her. And when she gets out of the car and tries to get away, he shoots her. He's not those type of killers that we see. They want to portray him as a cold, calculating killer. I don't know why it looks like that. But when you kind of take a, a deeper look and you, you look at even the, the mental health evaluation that was attached to the PSI by the investigator, as well as Dr. LaCroix's report, you kind of get a better picture. Mr. Schwab is is a man who's been bullied and neglected basically his whole life. Not neglected by those close to him on purpose, but more neglected out of a lack of understanding or even out of an effort to see him as, uh, I don't think his family wanted to really understand his deficits in a way that would have helped him. You know, I, I do have one exhibit. I didn't mark it as a number. I've given it to the state already. I can submit that to the court. Just being in church? No, Your Honor. As I said, I didn't mark it, so I don't know what, what we should call it. It's not defense exhibit one. Is that one, Your Honor? Yes. Thank you. That, Your Honor, is a picture of, of young Philip Schwab and one of his sisters. Um, it's probably when he's right around seven to ten years old. And that's right around the time that kids start to notice that they're different. You're not in preschool anymore and you're, you're now in grade school. You're starting to notice the smart kids, the popular kids, the athletic kids. But that's when you start to notice you're different. And that's when the bullying started. He was different. His voice was different. He acted different. Did he get help? No. He worked his way through grade school and high school. Birthday parties? No. Sleepovers with friends? No. Scouts? No. Hanging out on the trampoline with your friends? Nope. Going to prom? Nope. A double date with you and your buddies? Nope. Hanging out with your friends, playing ball, playing video games? Nope. And Philip would, you know, it doesn't mean his life was completely horrible, but Philip would have you believe that he had some close friends. I don't know if that's true. I think he had friends. Uh, you throw on top of that, which is referenced in, in Dr. Croy's report, the split of his parents. Philip was the, the only son, his dad's only child. Um, he had three half sisters. And the sisters, of course, wanted to go with his mom, and Philip wanted to go with dad. And he felt torn in the middle. And all along, Philip's feeling this, but he's not emoting it. part of the, the uh, du jour syndrome and, and kind of what I, I guess I would call autism or that's what the best way I've heard it described is it's kind of a, 
doesn't process the emotions like we would. It doesn't mean he doesn't feel them. It means he's not going to process them and emote them. So he's getting made fun of in, 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 in when he's seven or ten because of his voice. He feels it, but he doesn't emote it. He goes through school, like I said, with no friends, no sleepovers, no birthday parties. He feels it, but he doesn't emote it. He is suffering the trauma of a divorce that we all know for, and I don't want to call them less than average or, or diminish the meaning or anything, but regular kids are going to be torn up by their parents' divorce. He's torn up. He feels it, but he's not emoting it. Um, ultimately, he ends up living with his dad. From what I can tell, it was, for lack of a better term, a fairly unique relationship. And I don't know if it's because dad treated him like one of the guys. His dad was his best friend, his only real friend. Philip was working, he had a real social life for what it's worth, the best he had in his life, and things are going great. Then his dad gets sick, ends up in hospice, and dies of lung cancer. He feels it, but he's not emoting it. Ultimately, he ends up moving over here, Tyrell Falls, and volunteers at the zoo, I think his mom tried to get him out of the house as much as she could. Uh, he went to the garden, but basically lived a life in the basement. The court also notes in Dr. LaCroix's uh, report about the counseling history that we see. And so all along while Phil is feeling these things and these things are building up and he's not emoting them, it can be seen as, a, as maybe, you know, it's not as bad as it seems as he as he seems, what's really going on. Because he doesn't have that ability to process and articulate to you and I and, and counselors even what he's really going through, what really needs to be addressed. Oh, you're depressed, here's a pill. Um, one glaring hole in the, in the Pearl Health Counseling records, they know he has the short syndrome. That's it. No indication that there was any, any tailoring of treatment or counseling or education for Phil that would have specifically addressed how someone in his situation with his condition is going to react to treatment. Or what would they best learn? Or how can they get him to emote? Judge, when you see in the pre-sentence investigation report and their recommendation and they say that he He appeared unwilling to discuss his crime. He was short and direct. That's because of his, his condition. It's not because he doesn't care about Kay or didn't care about Kay. It's not because he doesn't feel bad. I've got to know Phil for the last two years. He's not a client that's going to call me and shoot the breeze. He's short and direct because of his condition. pre investigator did not care even look or consider that. It's not a lack of empathy or a lack of feeling empathy. It's a lack of acting like she wanted him to act, to put on the show that she expected him to put on. That's not Phil. And it's not his fault. That's not to say that he doesn't bear some responsibility for what he did, because like his blues brother said, he made a choice. Certainly, there's a lot of things that could have been done over the course of his life, over the course of his relationship with Ms. Blue, that may have led to him actually being able to emote what was building up. And so, and I'm sure Ms. Bean would agree with this, one of the big questions we dealt with for two years, why? Why? And, and we've struggled with that. That's frankly what took the two years. Why? What am I going to show up to this court and say, Judge, 15 years is fair because of Phil's condition? It's fair because the situation that he found himself in, with all that building up, 
And then that unique situation that arose with his mom having surgery to leave. What happened when his dad was getting close to death? He left. Joe's life was turned upside down. So he's got that. May 30th is the anniversary of his father's death. That was just a few weeks, two or three weeks before we lost Kay. So that's going on in Phil's life. He gets off his medication. And you can see in the Facebook post, it starts to come out. That's what's happening. And so one of the things the court looks at is vengeance vengeance to uh, punish someone for Kate's death. But the court also looks at other things. Is there a chance of rehabilitation? Well, we're all educated more about Bill Schwab. It's out now. We know what situations not to put in. We know how we need to tailor treatment. He is learning. We've processed this over and over, Judge. He wants to know why worse than you do worse than his being does. He struggles with that. But now that we know we're one step closer to, to making sure that situation doesn't occur, there's um, deterrence. Uh, these type of crimes, I think, are hard to deter just because of the nature of the crime. There's no explanation. If someone's going to do it, they're going to do it. But to deter someone, to deter someone in a fiddle situation, I think, you know, but I understand that it's got to be part of it. Um, we think, given everything about this case, about Phil 15 years is very important. Dr. LaCroix noted that those with DeJour syndrome, their lifespan is shorter. Um, he's sentenced to 15 years. He'd be about 30 or 53 or 50, 48, sorry, uh, when he's eligible for parole. That doesn't mean he's going to get out. We all know that. But it'll be about 48. That's going to be getting close to the end. He may live to be 60. So the man that walks across the street drunk to rape and brutally murder a woman, he gets 20 because he's going to die. And I know it's not this court, and I know it's not this prosecutor's office. But that is a real kick in the gut to the community. And if that man, that's a fair sentence, I don't see how Phil Schwab's sentence should exceed that. Um, Philip is going to be a, a target in prison. Um, he's somewhat settled into jail here. Um, I think he would tell you he's not a target, but I don't believe that's accurate. Both, both the uh, evaluation that was attached to the pre-sentence report, Dr. Crowley's before I think indicate that he's going to be a target. He's going to be manipulated. He's going to be used. And so I think the court take uh, both the lifespan issue and the, the, the fact that he's going to be a target of victimization to say, you know, a year in prison to Phil Schwab might be a whole lot different than a year in prison to that gangbanger that was going to go execute somebody up in the foothills. A year in prison to him isn't close to what it would be to Phil Schwab. Finally, Your Honor, if if we were here talking about maybe a battery case or something like that, and probation or something that could be considered, I think I have a decent argument for this court that, that, that Mr. Schwab's risk of violence is low. Now that we know what was building up in him, we know that we can't give him counseling and, and uh, treatment that is going to ignore the fact that he's not emoting or ignore the fact that he's not pouring out his emotions. You really have to drag these things out. And so I think with, that, with an educated treatment provider, the proper living facility, an assisted living facility, that is going to you know, watch you more closely, that his, his risk is low. And that, that's, that's what Dr. LaCroix notes in her report. And so you know, the other big question Besides the why was, is this going to happen again out of the blue? And I would argue the court it's not. Because we're all more educated, including Phil, his family, the system, treatment providers. We'd all be more educated now. That we would be able to know these things and, and avoid the situation that gave rise to this. 
So we think, given everything, that the court would justify imposing a life sentence, but with a 15-year fix, we would ask the court to do that. And so in closing, I would like to thank Kay's family for being here. We didn't try to delay this to drag that out, to hurt them. It's just the, the way the process goes. Um, we do hurt for them, feel hurts for them. And so unless the court has questions, I would turn the time on this. Thank you, Mr. Frank. Ms. Bean, Kevin State's recommendations. Thank you, Your Honor. I do want to just also kind of talk about for a minute what Mr. Crane talked about right at the end there. This case did take a long time. Some of that was due to COVID and circumstances, and um, I know the evaluation took a long time, but I know he wasn't purposefully delaying things. Um, that He had very good communication with me. He didn't hold anything back in his communications we were able to fully discuss and negotiate this case in a way that should be the way the system works and then you end up in a trial if after all those things you can't come to an agreement um, or anything but the communication was forthright back and forth on both sides and and I appreciated his professionalism throughout the process um, I am the, the overarching question, as Mr. Crane mentioned, is why this happened. And so normally when I come before the court and talk about sentencing um, and factors I want the court to consider, I talk about mitigating factors and aggravating factors, and those will be um, incorporated into my argument. But what I want to talk about and show the court some of the differences are things that we know and things that we don't know still to this day. Um, so I want to first talk about what we know. And Mr. Crane uh, did a really good job of going through the evaluation and talking about the issues that Mr. Schwab has due to the DeJore's syndrome. Um, the, the report was very comprehensive. It included a lot of life detail as well as, as he mentioned, the parole health counseling records and show that Mr. Schwab was getting treated for various things, including depression and, and medical issues, and, and talking to that counselor. And I would agree with Mr. Crane that Mr. Schwab does not articulate things. He's very literal. He's very matter-of-fact. And that could be portrayed and, and perceived as him not caring. And in the evaluation, he did indicate that, that he was sorry, that he wished he could take things back, and that he missed Kaylin. And I appreciate that, and I take that for what it's worth. Um, as he has met with Ms. LaCroix over the course of time, and, and she was able to build a rapport with him versus the short nature of the pre-sentence investigation interview. Uh, I will say that in spite of the short nature of the pre-sentence investigation interview and how that is designed, it is someone who is a professional and used to meeting with someone in a short time frame, evaluating collateral information and coming to a conclusion and making recommendations to the court. When I look at the recommendations of the pre-sentence investigation, which is sentenced to a term of incarceration for the murder of Kaylin Blue. Uh, this is the last paragraph. His callous, calculated, and brutal actions cut short the life of a young woman who was an asset to the community and touched so many lives. The damage she caused did not end with Ms. Blue's death. His actions also caused her family unimaginable grief and ongoing trauma for years to come. Those recommendations make complete and total sense to me, having all the information that I have in front of me and I think are very logical. Um, as I'll get into more about what happened that day, uh, the court can take for what it's worth what his actions speak to the nature of what happened and, and the pre-sentence investigator's um, recommendation. She doesn't make a recommendation on a specific term of incarceration. She just says incarceration and the statute frankly already contemplates that. So I think her recommendations are in line with what everyone is expecting. Um, she didn't perceive that he was remorseful. Um, the court has the full and complete information there. 
So what, some more things that we do know is that um, Kaylin Blue was in a relationship with the defendant for approximately seven years uh, prior to what happened and that he has struggled with this, um, it's called by a couple names, but DeGeorge, DeGeorge syndrome, velocardiofacial syndrome, and that has caused numerous physical and mental issues for him, and that is a permanent condition. Um, I have sympathy for the things that he experienced as a child, being, you know, not normal, quote unquote normal, um, growing up and having kids treat him poorly and, and not being able to fully participate as other kids would in, in various activities. When I look at those, however, they're not a reason to kill someone. And so they're, they're sympathetic, but that's pretty much the length that I'm willing to go on, on my sympathies towards that. Um, Kaylin and the defendant moved into Idaho Falls uh, with the defendant's mom, Cheryl. And um, that's where it brings us to June 22nd. And um, the defendant told police that he and Kaylin had gone to bed around 10 p.m. Uh, she went to sleep quickly, per the usual, but he stayed awake also pretty much per the usual. He was looking at Facebook and doing things on his phone. At 11.50 p.m., he texted his mom, who was, as we know, recovering from surgery. She wasn't in any life-threatening situation, but she was at a, the Promontory Point Rehabilitation Center here in Idaho Falls after having surgery in Utah. And he tells her um, at about 11.50 p.m., uh, he says, always LOL in response to a previous um, text thread. Um, and his mom sends him a blowing kiss emoji back. He says, it's going to be over soon, and I just want to hear you, LOL. And he says, just a heads up. And she says back to him, what's going to be over soon, honey? And he says, LOL, don't worry about it, you'll know. And she says back to him, that scares me, Phil. Are you okay? He says, I'm fine, smiley face. It's good, I'll TTYL or talk to you later. She says to him, okay, I trust you. I love you, son. Lots of exclamation points. He says, love you too. At about 12.24 a.m. on the 23rd, he posted on his Facebook page, if stabbing someone is wrong, I don't wanna be right. And this was not the first time that he had posted messages about stabbing someone, and they even predate his mom's surgery. Uh, the defendant then tells police that Kaylin was thrashing about in, his, in her sleep, so he retrieved a buck knife that he had a couple of days previous to this put in his nightstand and this knife was a piece of memorabilia he had got because he was very into horror movies and really liked the movie Scream so we would had bought a knife that was replicated from that movie. Uh, he walked to Kaylin's side of the bed after retrieving that out of his nightstand and stabbed her in the neck while she was sleeping. She did nothing to precipitate this that could be characterized as any reason to stab her in the neck. She woke up immediately and tried to get away. He was, had walked to her side of the bed. She tried to crawl to his side of the bed. And he went over across the bed and struggled with her. Um, they end up standing up and they're standing face to face while he is repeatedly stabbing her in her head and face and neck also in her chest area while she, according to him and his statement to police, is yelling stop and help. As she continued to fight for her life, they end up moving in their struggle to the bathroom area that's also by the bedroom. And the defendant tells police that he, that they both end up kneeling on their hands and knees in the bathroom. Um, he gets on top of her and continues to stab her as many times as it takes until she's gone. Then he lays on top of her 
until she, he can tell that she has stopped breathing. Uh, the cause of death was determined by autopsy to be multiple stab wounds, and he stabbed her approximately 25 times. stabbed her in the left upper cheek three times in the forehead, up the left lower forehead, the left forehead stabbed once, um, a U-shaped injury that was both a stab and blunt force, a vertical stab wound on the right side of her brow and the ridge of her nose, a diagonal stab wound by her eye on the left side, a stab puncture wound just above on the scalp just above her left ear, a long horizontal gaping incise wound on her right upper cheek, a stab wound on the right side of her neck behind her ear, three stab wounds on her upper cheek on the right side, a stab wound in her left upper neck, two stab wounds on her left upper neck, another stab wound on her neck, a large gaping stab wound on her lower neck and another one on her neck, a stab wound on her upper side of her neck and one by her scalp, a stab wound uh, to the left upper chest and then two more stab wounds on her left breast area. This doesn't include all the marks that she had and the, and the knife wounds that she had on her hands from trying to fight Mr. Schwab off during this attack. Um, the report goes on to say that um, there were it, two stab wounds, one particularly to the thoracic cavity, and which resulted in a collapsed lungs, and then an actual stab wound to the lung that probably were the actual cause of her death. Tristan Blue got up and, and read his statement and had very many good and positive things to say about Miss Blue, one of the things that he said that as he talked about her fears was that of needles and knives and anything puncturing her skin to where she's 33 years old and doesn't have her ears pierced. That's, that's amazing to me. That seems almost like a given in our society today. So the way that she died had to be the absolute most terrifying thing for her. And Mr. Schwab, as Mr. Blue indicated, knew that about Kaylin. After Mr. Schwab stabbed her, he went and decided to bury her in the backyard, and so he got the hose and tried to soften some of the grass area and, and dig that up and bury her, but he didn't do a very good job, and parts of her body were um, visible from the outside. Also, um, during that time, his um, he also killed the dogs who were going over to the area where she was. He killed them and put them in the trash dumpster in the garage. At about 2.42 a.m., he texted his mom, help, she says, call me. And then she says, cell phone. At about 4.52 a.m., he texts her, just us, dot, dot, dot. And then he says, I'm ready to have fun with you, dot, dot, dot. His mom responds right now, question marks, a lot of question marks, what do you wanna do? Go dancing, not sure what's open on a Sunday morning. And then I fell asleep. And she responded having no idea what he had just done and what he meant by just us. And I don't know what he meant by, I'm ready to have fun with you. That's another thing we don't know. Kaylin Blue was an innocent. She was a person who went about being responsible and bringing joy to those in the community, always trying to uplift, never bring down, and was a support person for Mr. Schwab. As Tristan said, a couple of the things that I noted in his letter, 
Kindness was the, at the center of her actions. She always put others before herself. She spread love and compassion towards someone struggling or having a bad day. These are things we know. Um, as I indicated, I do believe he has a sense of remorse and regret. Um, he wishes he could take it back. I believe that he does. But the fact is, another thing we know is he can't. This is another thing that is permanent, not just in his life, but in the life of Kaylin Blue's family and those who cared about her. Um, because of those diagnoses as well, we have to look towards what do we do with Mr. Blue. Um, included in Dr. LaCroix's uh, report, she quoted from Dr. Lander's report that the court had earlier seen and his conclusion paragraph, and this is on page 18 of 37 of the um, report. The defendant has a history of psychological symptoms that were active at the time of these charges. His psychological symptoms will not respond to treatment. Rather, supervision and structure will be necessary to provide the defendant with the ability to function in the future. The defendant's mom also participated in this evaluation and indicated that it's better that he not live with her when released in case that living situation contributed in any way to what happened to Caitlin. Uh, we also know, uh, since Mr. Crane brought it up, about some other Bonneville County cases, and these are known things that the court can consider. So uh, first of all, I would like to talk about the Brian Drips case. Um, his actions were incredibly heinous. His actions are a good example of the long lasting effects that someone taking the life of someone else in a brutal way have on the family members and the community. I mean, this community literally is still reeling from something that never gets put to rest, his circumstances. Um, of the case are one thing and, and the fact of how that all came about, but it definitely shows that feelings can be fresh years and years, even decades after the fact. However, we're not talking about some of the limitations that happened in the Drips case. And one of those limitations was that case could not go to trial. There were problems with that case. And that case didn't have a confession that was a solid confession like we had here. Here, when the police arrived to Mr. Schwab's house on the welfare check that was spurred by Kaylin not showing up to Walgreens, and then coworkers you know, noticing that she's gone, and that's not her usual pattern of behavior. Um, and they call, and they call Philip's mom, and then they call um, law enforcement. Um, law enforcement shows up to the house, if you watch the video, it's almost immediately that you can see that Mr. Schwab is trying to tell the police officers that Kaylin is in the backyard. And he proceeds to tell police officers everything that happened. And he did that with a proper Miranda warning, and that, that confession is solid. The court knows that when you have issues with a case, problems with the case, sometimes you reach resolutions that are due to the, the problems on both sides of the case, the issues of some, the, a jury liking someone, a jury understanding something, and evidence that may be suppressed. And so sometimes you reach a resolution for those reasons. This resolution was not reached for any of those reasons. So for the court to say 20 years is appropriate as a like sentence would be an inappropriate conclusion because that sentence, that recommendation by the Attorney General's office and that agreement was reached because of the problems with that case. And we don't have that circumstance here. So since we don't have that circumstance here, we just go back to looking at community protection, deterrence, rehabilitation, and punishment without those complicating factors. Another case that recently came in front of Judge Watkins was Jamie and Hernandez. 
uh, Jamie and Hernandez killed Lisa Stukey. He hit her over the head, smashed her skull with a baseball bat, left her in her residence. She, her body was not discovered for two weeks. And in that case, um, Jamie and Hernandez was diagnosed by Dr. Linda Hatzenbuehler as having adverse childhood experiences, ACEs, a specific diagnosis, um, not just unfortunate things happen. He had a specific diagnosis with numerous things of abuse and neglect and a childhood we would not want anyone to have to repeat. And that was a huge mitigating factor because of those things that he had experienced and formed his childhood. Um, he also was someone who felt very justified in what he did because he felt he was righting a wrong against his family. He felt like Lisa Stuckey had um, caused his adoptive parents to lose out on inheritance because she somehow got in and got his uh, grandpa to change the will. Well, that's not necessarily valid, but he did feel that he had um, some justification, right, being on his side to remove this person he perceived as wronging his family. Here, we don't even have the justification like Jamie and Hernandez thought in his brain was a good justification, even though we know it's not. This was just random and brutal, unexpected, and not to someone who had wronged him, but to someone who was his biggest support. Mr. Schwab's case. Uh, Jamie and Hernandez got 25 years, taking all things into account of his feelings of justification, his adverse childhood experiences, and the things that were at play in his psyche when he did this, and 25 years was an appropriate resolution in that case. That's what we're asking the court to do in this case. The state does not see anything that is so mitigating in the DeGeorge syndrome diagnoses that would, would say that 25 years in that other case was not an appropriate one in this case. And part of that is because of what we don't know in this case, and still to this day, we don't know it. We don't know why. And Dr. LaCroix uh, gave some conclusions. Uh, this is on page. Thirty-four of thirty-seven. His background is the third paragraph down. His background is significant for being bullied due to his obvious phenotypical abnormalities, the trauma of his parents' divorce, his father's unusual parenting style, and death from cancer. Phil has never lived on his own, has been dependent upon his parents his entire life. Then she says, the instant offense occurred when his mother was in a facility recuperating from major surgery, which caused Phil extreme distress as he had already lost his father to cancer and likely prompted a brief psychotic episode as he was also off his medications for several weeks. It was an unfortunate circumstance that is unlikely to reoccur and he has had no behavioral disturbances of any kind before or since even despite the stress of being in jail. She goes on to talk about the pandemic. It is unlikely to reoccur. How do we know? We don't really know if those were the things that caused Mr. Schwab to, to do this, or he liked the movie Scream and wanted to use out his movie memorabilia and found a handy reason to do it because he had kept that knife in the nightstand. We don't know. Since we don't know, we have to protect the community. And I understand that Mr. Schwab has um, an average expected lifespan of 46 years, could live into his upper 60s at most from the reports. I understand that. But that doesn't necessarily matter to keeping the community safe. If we want to keep the community safe, we have to look at what an appropriate time in prison is. Not his lifespan, 
what the time for the crime demands. And so the state would say that's 25 years. I want to close by saying one other thing that we don't know. We don't know and can't quantify the trauma that the Blue family is going to experience for the rest of their lives. In fact, even coming to this kind of hearing can be traumatic to hear the details of things put in front of them in pretty stark terms, but hopefully not too traumatizing. They're going to go on and things are going to happen. And as Tristan said, milestones are going to happen and Kaylin won't be there. Um, random times, you just all of a sudden have a quiet moment and Kaylin, thoughts of Kaylin are going to come into their mind. That's normal and natural when you lose somebody. And that's going to go on for the rest of their lives. And we don't know how severe that's going to be or that impact on them forever. Um, so the court should fashion a sentence based on what we know and taking into account what we don't know and keep the community safe. Uh, the state has, uh, I'll just close with restitution. The state has filed a motion for restitution. I understand there's no objection to the amount. However, we would like restitution kept open for as long as the court is willing to keep restitution open as there are, as Tristan mentioned, other costs that were paid out that, that um, are large. Um, there's costs yet to be incurred with counseling and things like that. So we would like restitution kept open for as long as the court is willing. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Schwab, before I impose sentence in this matter, you need a chance to address the court. You are not required to say anything, nor do I hold it against you in any way if you choose not to say anything. Or if you do wish to exercise your right of allocution or your right to address the court, I would give you that chance. Schwab, well, is there anything you'd like to say to the court at this time? I don't think so, Your Honor. I think it's already been said by my counsel and this include especially. All right. Are you satisfied with the representation your attorney has provided you? Yes, Your Honor. Mr. Crane, is there any legal reason why I should not sentence the defendant today? Not that I'm aware of today, Your Honor. Thank you, Mr. Crane. Mr. Schwab, based upon your plea of guilty, the judgment of this court that you are guilty of the crime of murder in the first degree in this case. This was a horrific crime. It was shocking in its wantonness. And really, the court hasn't been able to find a reason. I've listened with great care to your counsel's argument, to the state's arguments, to the victim impact statement, for Mr. Blue. I've carefully reviewed the psychiatric evaluation that was submitted in this matter. I have considered the objectives of criminal sentencing, those of protection of society, deterrence, rehabilitation, and punishment. And frankly, the same questions that have been discussed today I've wondered about. As I reviewed this case and reviewed your history the events of the day, uh, the horrific day, Kaylin died. I actually found myself wandering around the courthouse, trying to figure it out, asking that same question that's been discussed here today. Why did this crime occur? Unfortunately, in my career as a defense attorney, as a prosecutor, and as a judge, I've seen a lot of crimes and have handled lots of cases. This one makes no sense. Even after reading through the evaluations and considering those, and I'm going to address those in a minute, and I appreciate your counsel's arguments and the work that he put into it. I think it was very thorough. I have struggled with the why, and I'm frankly grateful that, that both your counsel and state have addressed that. And it's even greater question as I read, or excuse me, listened, Mr. Blue's statement and looked at these pictures of the victim. I wrote down some things that were said in the victim impact statement. Loving, compassionate, positive, radiant, forgiving, 
It's clear. You were in a relationship for seven years. It's clear that she had those qualities. The hardest thing about criminal law, and why when I and I've already considered and indicated the criteria the court has to use, I would note that there is no criteria to try and bring the victim back. There's nothing this court can do to alleviate the pain or the suffering of the victim's family in this case. And I want to just acknowledge that, that the court can't do that. But the court does take into account the life that was lost and the good person that the victim was in this case. The court was also frankly struck. I looked at this picture uh, of you, Mr. Schwab, when you were young, and have considered the bullying. And in fact, that was as I, as I considered this case and walked around considering what to do in this matter. I acknowledge the fact that you had physical difficulties and because of that uh, and because of your childhood there was bullying. In fact, I wrote that down the very first time that I read through the reports. I wanted to refer uh, in fact to the evaluation where it talks about that because I do find that as a mitigating factor in this case. When we look to the diagnosis it's on page 33 and it talks about the DeJour syndrome. The moderate intellectual disability, the autism disorder, hearing loss, scoliosis, chronic back pain. Mr. Schwab, life has not been fair to you. It has been, it's been difficult. I was impressed with how your mother has handled things. And frankly, uh, I acknowledge those deficits. And as I considered this and considered how you were brought up and raised and those difficulties. And I acknowledge and, and read through those and thought about that and thought about how this and those diagnoses and the reality of your upbringing tie into this. interesting as I uh, listened to this I kept going back and I hadn't highlighted this but based upon what your your counsel said and even what Mr. Blue has said in his statement uh, I wanted to refer to page 27's report where it talks about uh, kind of how you described what was going on I was talking about what happened that talks about how it just, those emotions just were coming out. And I can't recall if that was on page 27, but you talked about how, as this was going on, the emotions that were pouring out of you. And Mr. Crane talked about how you had been uh, bullied and how you didn't emote it. And that those emotions just built up. And it's difficult for the court and I think it's difficult for society to understand that. Difficult for you to understand that. But then you hear the state talk about in their in their statement, and I've read through those evaluations and, and through how it factored into what happened that night. But to talk about the step by step events of this crime where you would post things on Facebook showing some level of premeditation. The texting to your mother, the statement of if stabbing someone is wrong, I don't want to be right. And then to walk over stab the victim in the neck. Like I said, it just I've struggled with the same question that your counsel in the state have struggled with which is why this occurred. So the court, in considering what to do, 
we're never going to, I think, know why. The court doesn't have to figure that out. I only do that to try and understand what the best thing to do is in this case. The court has the obligation of reviewing this slide and the objectives of, of, the, of the criteria of criminal sentencing, as I've already indicated, but also the criteria set forth now in Code 19 relative to those questions of imprisonment and what the court should consider. Courts heard, and I'm aware of the different cases that have happened in this jurisdiction. I've been involved in many of those. And recognize that the court has the obligation of balancing the different sentences that were given, but also acknowledging and recognizing that each case stands on its own. Each case stands as its own separate case, and the court uh, does attempt to consider other sentences However, ultimately, the criteria is protecting society, deterrence, rehabilitation, and punishment. And as indicated, I acknowledge that there's nothing the court can do to bring any type of closure to the victim's family or to help in any way with that. And the court, like I said, only intends at this point to deal with you, Mr. Schwab, and to, and to deal with issues of society. I'm not going to go over, I thought about going over the specific facts of the case, the state did that, and acknowledge that Mr. Crane laid out the evaluations. And like I said, I've, I've considered it over and over and over again as I read through this case and what to do. Based on all the criteria and considering the evidence before me and the re recommendations as presented here in court, it's going to be the judgment of this court. Schwab to be sentenced to the custody of the Auto Department of Corrections as follows. For a maximum term of life in prison with an indeterminate, excuse me, with a fixed portion of 25 years in this matter. So it'd be a 25 year sentence to life. I recognize that's what the state asked for. I've considered it less. However, the court feels like to give less would be inappropriate based upon the facts of this case. In order to find in this case, Your Honor, the maximum is fifty thousand on the fine plus a five thousand dollar compensatory fine. The court is is not. Uh, I just want to make sure there wasn't a minimum fine in this matter for the court there, right? Of course, only going to order a $5,000 fine, as well as a $5,000 compensatory fine to the victim in this case. Standard court costs, payments into the victim's relief fund. Court will order restitution in the amount of $3,285.66. Reimbursement the county for public defender service in the amount of $500. That's a nominal fee, uh, but the court uh, acknowledges the services of Mr. Crane. Feels like he's handled this matter well. Uh, we'll order in position of that sentence. We give you credit for the time that you've served in this matter, Mr. Schwab. The court will allow restitution to be ongoing uh, in this matter for costs such as counseling expenses as they arise, uh, acknowledging that the, there is a, certainly a need for that. So the court will allow that to go on well, the, frankly, for the duration of the, of the sentence in this matter. Uh, they will need to be presented to the court and approved by both sides. Let me advise you, Mr. Schwab, you have the right to appeal to the Ottawa Supreme Court from this judgment of conviction. You have a right to represent a binding attorney in that appeal if you cannot afford one. It will be a point of view public expense. However, you have 42 days from the day's date to file that. You also may have rights under Idaho Criminal Rule 35 if you feel the sentence was illegal or unduly harsh. You have 120 days for that. You also have the right to seek relief under the Idaho Uniform Post-Conviction Relief Act. Such an action must be filed in one year from the day that your right to appeal expires. If you have any questions about that, please consult with Mr. Crane. Also going to order the collection of a DNA sample and a right thumbprint consistent with Idaho Code. Anything else in this matter, Mr. Crane, this time? No, Your Honor. Ms. Bean? No, Your Honor. All right. Uh, once again, I express my condolences to the victim's family, and at this point, being racist on this matter. Thank you. All rise, please.